Hello, this is Terry Wheeler, and I'd like to welcome you to our last PSM webinar of the year, Developing Your Marketing Plan for 2018 and Tips to Drive New Revenue in the New Year. This is actually one of our better, more highly attended webinars, and I think it's because at this time of year, people are always thinking about what went well this year, where they had their successes, what they want to do differently in 2018. So at the end of this webinar, I am confident that you will have the tools that you need to develop your marketing plan for 2018. So let me just briefly introduce myself to those of you who have not been to one of our webinars before. My name is Terry Wheeler, and I'm the founder and president of Professional Services Marketing. For about 12 years before I started my company, I served as a marketing director in three large law firms. So that's where I really cut my teeth on professional services marketing. I currently serve as Vice Chair of the Executive Committee for the Lawyers Board of Professional Responsibility, which governs all of the ethical behaviors of attorneys in the state of Minnesota. I do a lot of writing as well, and I'm a nationally syndicated columnist for a publication called Attorney at Law Magazine, and I was just asked again to be a featured columnist for the American Bar Association's GP Solo E-Report. So I'm looking forward to that. I do a lot of presenting at law schools, and it's fun for me to be able to look at new attorneys and see the fear in their eyes when they're looking at what am I really going to do, what am I getting myself into by going into private practice, and to really help them with various different steps, tips, and ideas on how they can be successful. I also happen to have my master's degree from the University of St. Thomas. So with that, let's move into what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to give you tools that are going to help you better understand who your best contacts are, but most importantly, what those individuals have in common, not just your best clients, but also your best referral sources. We're going to investigate what makes you unique as a professional. We're going to talk about who you're really marketing to, your target audiences, and what should your messages be for those audiences. We're also going to get into marketing objectives and why marketing objectives are so important in the roadmap that will become your marketing plan for next year. Also, having a revenue goal is extremely important. You can't just be out there saying, well, I think I want to generate an extra $500,000 of business. We have to get into more depth than that, and I have a tool that I developed that is going to help you do just that. Then finally, I'm going to give you some tips on how to take action. Obviously, you can have the best marketing plan in the world, but if you don't have a plan to implement it, it will gather dust on your desktop or on your bookshelf. So let's take a look at the materials that you have access to. For those of you who attended the webinar live, you were able to download all of the various different materials. Anyone who's interested in these can send me an email and I will happily send each of these documents to you. Because what we're talking about today is using the tool I developed for you to create your marketing plan for 2018. I'm also giving you a 2018 sales pipeline. This is a pipeline that we use with all of our clients and I've updated it for 2018 and wanted you to be the first recipients of it. I also hear from a lot of very busy professionals that they don't have time to do marketing. So I'm like a myth buster and I put together 40 ideas, marketing ideas you can do in five minutes or less. It's also really important to have compelling pieces of experience that show that you have done what your clients need, much more than just a list of bulleted services that you offer. And then we also have accessible a PowerPoint of all the slides that you're seeing right now. So as we get started, let's talk about something pretty important, and that is that your marketing plan has some specific building blocks. You could consider these phases of your marketing plan. The first thing that you want to do is to step back and you want to assess. You want to throw everything on the table, so to speak. You want to look at what's worked, what hasn't worked, who your competitors are, what you did well, what you wish you hadn't done. You're going to look at new clients that you brought in the door and how those clients found you. 
you're simply going to step back and do what all of you would do if you were getting started with a new client. Whether you're a financial advisor or a lawyer, you're going to ask a lot of questions and you're going to put some sort of an assessment together before you start giving advice. The same is true for your marketing plan. So the next thing we're going to talk about are the building blocks, well excuse me, the plan itself is one of the building blocks of your marketing plan. So you need to have a thorough and complete marketing plan for you to follow. As I mentioned before, consider it the roadmap of your future. Only after you have assessed your practice and put a plan in place should you then think about the implementation strategies and implementation tactics that you want to pursue. Then finally, every single thing that you do in marketing should have a way in which you can measure that strategy. If something that you're thinking about doing in marketing doesn't have a direct cause and effect way in which to measure the results, it's likely something that you should pass on. Now, as we get into implementation, and those of you who have been on our webinars in the past are probably familiar with this term, the four pillars of marketing is a term that I coined many years ago when I was working in law firms trying to help lawyers really figure out and boil down to the basics what it means to implement a marketing plan. So the first pillar of marketing is really, think of it as a, the very first concentric ring, is all about retaining and growing relationships with your existing clients, contacts, referral sources. It's about leveraging the best of what you have right now. Because not to do that is, is absolutely wasting so much of your time and energy since, as most of you know, a significant percentage of next year's clients will come from relationships that you already have, that you're already nurturing and growing. The second pillar of marketing is about attracting new clients and developing new business. This is about getting your name out there in front of people who don't know you yet, but should. The third pillar of marketing is about increasing your name recognition and awareness in the marketplace. You can be the greatest professional since sliced bread, but if people don't know who you are, it's going to be a lot harder for you to break into the markets that you'd like to serve. So a big part of your implementation of your marketing plan is going to be about tips and ideas to build your name recognition and awareness in the market. Then finally, the fourth pillar of market, marketing in your implementation plan is going to be about creating targeted and effective communications. This covers everything from your website to events to how you manage and store and house the contacts that you have, your online marketing, how you communicate with, how you communicate with your prospective clients, your current clients. So let's move now into what you need to do as you look at your very best clients. Now, one of the things that I've always ensured and tried to help professionals do is to not become overwhelmed by all of the contacts that you have. We're not talking about everyone you're connected to on LinkedIn or everyone who's in your Outlook contacts. When I'm talking about your top contacts, I'm talking about creating top 10 lists so look at your contacts and pick your very best top 10 current clients. Some of your past clients, as you know, past clients can be a great referral source. You also want to look at some prospective clients, those clients that you think about and say, gosh, I wish I had a, an entree into that client because my expertise is a great fit for what they need. So it's some of those clients or individuals that you would like to do business with. If you're an individual professional, for example, if you're a family law lawyer, you're not going to be looking at prospective clients from the standpoint of the 50% of people who might get divorced this year. You're going to be looking at building relationships with professionals like therapists, like financial advisors. I say this because I want you to know that my expectation for people who have individuals as clients is not that you're going to go out and identify prospective clients in that way. So think about your referral sources as well. And when I talk about referral sources, 
I'm talking about the people who not just refer business to you, but also those who are in your network that you refer business to. It's very important. When you're developing refer referral source relationships, you want them to be mutually beneficial. So think about both those you refer to as well as those who you refer to. Now I mentioned that there is a tool in the materials and it is the 2018 sales pipeline. So this is the place where you're going to house those top 10 lists. In the materials, this is, an, this is actually an Excel document so you can add lines and I want to point out that there are a couple of really important columns here in this pipeline. The first one is the revenue potential. If you can monetize your opportunities, it gives you much more of a focus when you're pursuing those relationships. And also the next step, think about how many times you have had, let's say, a really great coffee or lunch with someone. You really hit it off. They said, wow, you're great. I'm going to send all these different clients to you. And then what happens? In many cases, nothing happens. And it's not because they changed their mind about you. It's because there wasn't a next step. So I encourage you with every single person that you're building a relationship with, always make sure that there's a next step. Even if it's something like reconnect with this person in two months, just to check in, say hi, see how they're doing, to stay connected. But marketing plans without next steps really fall by the wayside. So I encourage you to really fully complete this. Now let's talk a little bit about some of your best clients. We want to talk about the traits and characteristics that your best clients have in common. The reason we do that is because if you're proactively marketing for new clients, of course you'd like to replicate or clone the best clients that you have. So the way that we do that is we first look at what do they have in common. One way that we can do that is to also look at some of those clients that you end up working with and you wonder, how did I ever accept them as a client? I wish they weren't my client. So you can also figure out what your best clients have in common by looking at what your quote unquote worst clients have in common. And one of the reasons that this is so important is because nobody should have door clients. You're all too professional to have door clients. And really, it's simple. So what is a door client? A door client is anyone who comes in your door. The goal with a strategic marketing plan is to identify what makes you unique in the marketplace. It's to determine your best and highest use as a professional. It's to look at the traits and characteristics that your best clients have in common so that you can try to replicate them. Sure, you're going to have opportunities that sort of land in your lap and at that time you can decide if it's a client that you want or not. But you don't ever want to be in a position where you feel that you have to accept every client who walks in your door. That's also a little bit concerning, particularly for lawyers and even more particularly for newer lawyers because they're hungry, they want clients, and they're more inclined to take anyone who comes in the door even if they don't feel that they have subject matter mastery over the legal matter that that person is looking for or the type of service. Those can be bad situations and we're talking about potential ethics violations or potential malpractice. It's just really important that you know what your best clients have in common so that you can figure out when you're talking to someone who likely isn't going to be one of your best clients. So when we're talking about the traits and characteristics of your very best clients and contacts, you want to aspire to really add A-level people into your practice. What you want to ask yourself is, I use this all the time when I'm looking at a potential client, is this someone who I would refer business to, either an individual or to the company, that I have enough trust and respect for them that I would actually refer them to someone I care about? Which leads to the second thing you want to look at, honestly. When you look at this individual that you might do business with, do you like them? Do you trust them? Do you respect them after you've spoken with them? Do they feel the same way about you? 
There's nothing worse than having a client who is consistently questioning everything you do and who is not responding and they're not engaged in the process. So what's really important also is they need to see the value that you deliver as a professional. Finally, are they responsive and engaged? You want to have clients who you're engaged in the process of helping them and they have to be equally engaged in the process of letting you help them. And you know what that means. They need to take the action items that, that, that you assign to them. If not, it's a pain because you have to then spend your valuable time or that of your staff following up and asking for documents that you need in order to move forward. Whether you're a financial advisor or an attorney or any other professional, you need to have clients who are responsive and who are engaged in the process. Now let's move into a discussion about what makes you unique. Because yes, you are all unique butterflies. And it doesn't matter what type of professional service you're providing. If you're a lawyer, a financial advisor, a consultant, a CPA, it doesn't matter. There are things in your personality, in your background, in your areas of expertise that do make you unique. Those are the traits, those are the things that we want to focus your marketing efforts around. Because to say that I'm a generalist and I can do anything for anybody, well then your butterfly turns blue and you blend in and you can't differentiate yourself. And that's not how you're going to get the best kind of clients. It's by focusing in on what makes you unique as a professional. And then making sure that when you're talking to people that you're stressing those areas that really make you unique. So how is it that you're going to know your unique value? One of the things that you have to ask yourself is what value do you deliver to your clients? What is unique about your experience, different than everybody else who does what you do? It might be something like, for example, I used to work with a financial advisor and she did comprehensive financial planning, but she had this unique part of her practice where she helped executives at a particular company with their deferred compensation, their executive comp packages, and their stock option plans. Well, she learned all of the intricacies of that company's stock option plan so that the vast majority of executives in the country, or excuse me, in the company, worked with her because she knew the intricacies. That made her unique and that made people in that company really want to work with her. What concerns do you alleviate for your niche market? We need to have you focus on the problems that you solve for your clients. Not just the name, rank, and serial number of what you do, but rather the concerns and problems that you alleviate for your clients. I love this one because it's all about what do you want people, what do you want your clients and your referral sources to tell others about you when they're referring you. There's nothing more frustrating than receiving a referral from somebody and you start talking to the person and you realize, hmm, this is really not a good referral for me. You've been waiting and waiting and waiting for someone to send you a referral, for this particular referral source to send you a referral and then it's not the right kind of referral. So I think it's really important for you to educate your referral sources and let them know how you want them to introduce you and share that with them. Let's move into target audiences. Now this sounds kind of marketing jargony, but it's really important that you think about who it is that you're going to be marketing to. Because, as we all know, it can be really overwhelming. There are so many people out there. How do we separate, segregate, divide up the people who are out there that we might want to do, do business with? We need to say, okay, I can't be all things to all people. So let's focus. Let's create some laser focus, not generalities. You really have to identify the specific target audience who is going to most value your highest levels of expertise. So just to give you a few ideas, 
we want you to think about not just your past and current clients, but what industries are they in? What trade groups do they belong to? We want you to look at your referral sources. You're going to have very different messages for people you want to refer business to you than for people that you want to have hire you as a client. You're also going to have very different messages if you're trying to pitch yourself as a presenter to a trade or an industry group that attracts your prospective clients. And then also, don't forget the media. Don't forget other blogs that are out there. There are so many ways to take your message and proliferate it. You've got social media followers. You have to acknowledge that you have many different target audiences, but what really is most important for you are the key messages that you come up with. It's my opinion that for every target audience you have, you need to have one or two key messages that is specific to that target audience. You can't have a one-size-fits-all key message because it just isn't going to resonate the same way with every person. So as you're constructing your key messages for your marketing plan, you want to think about, what am I known for? When people call me, they say, gosh, I got your name and I've heard that you are the best at this or the best at that. What are you known for out there in the marketplace? And if you're not sure, talk to some clients of yours, talk to some referral sources, and get them to share with you what they think makes you unique. You also want to look at where you have more expertise than other professionals. This is the example that I gave about the stock option planning experience with a financial advisor. She has a lot more expertise and experience than other financial planners, and that needs to be part of her key messaging. On what topics are you a subject matter expert? There are many things that you do every day. A lot of the things you do because, okay, this came in, I have to do it. But then there are other things that come in and you're like, yes, I love doing this because it's a practice area or it's a service or it's something you're enjoying because generally speaking, it taps into your best and highest use as a professional. Also think about what industry attracts your best clients and how do I formulate key messages around the fact that you know and understand their industry. I think industry marketing is one of the most powerful ways to get in front of people. A lot of my clients who are lawyers tend to do a lot of CLEs. They'll attend them, which is great. They need their CLE credits, but they'll also present at CLEs which is really fine when you're building expertise, but many times if your industry, if you're in an industry like the legal industry and you speak at industry events, sometimes you're just focusing on training people who might ultimately be your competition. So it's important to think about those audiences that you're trying to reach, but also what it is you have to say to them. And those messages need to change depending upon the person you're talking to. So let's move into this amorphous area called setting your marketing objectives. Now, anyone who's been through any kind of a marketing program in high school, in college, um, in, in getting your MBA, or probably not in law school, but you learn how to set objectives. And you've probably heard this idea as well, that your objectives need to be in this order. They need to be very specific. They need to be something that when you're done with this activity or this objective, you can measure it. They need to be realistic and attainable. They need to be very results oriented and they have to have a deadline. They have to be time bound. You can't just say, I want to generate a million dollars in new business this year. You need to be very, very specific or I want to have more referral sources in this particular industry. So if you want more referral sources, the way that you would craft an objective is to say, I would like to develop three more financial advisor referral sources by June 30th of 2018. It's specific, it's measurable, of course it's realistic and attainable. Three, you can do three people, you can meet three new people. 
It's results oriented and it has a deadline, the end of June. You need to set marketing objectives that have these traits and characteristics. Otherwise, I just don't think you're going to do them. And even if you have objectives, there's a lot more to motivating yourself to take action on these objectives. But as you're setting your marketing objectives, and in the materials that I provided to you, I've identified, of course, the four pillars of marketing. And I've even prompted you with questions to ask under each of the subcategories. For example, client satisfaction, client service, referral source development. I'm asking you the questions in the materials that will allow you to create some smart marketing objectives. Now, another thing that I want to mention right now is that you do not need to have objectives under each one of these various different areas. I think there are 20 different subcategories. You don't need to have objectives around all of them. But what I would recommend is that you have at least a couple of objectives under each one of the pillars of marketing. Because that way, you're going to have a very balanced marketing strategy. You don't want to spend all of your time doing any one thing or under any one pillar. Because successful marketing for professionals is all about having a balance and doing things that are going to help you grow relationships, bring in new business, make sure that you are increasing your name recognition, but also that you're communicating in a very targeted fashion the key messages you've identified for all of the different target audiences you have. So the materials will walk you through exactly how to develop marketing objectives for these specific topical areas. So why is it important to have a revenue goal? A lot of people don't and they're successful and they generate new clients and they make more money next year than they did last year but for most people it's extremely helpful to step back and determine exactly what their real revenue goal is for the upcoming year I have put together in your materials a page that is literally like a little spreadsheet where you can identify all of your various different clients down the left hand side of the page you can identify what revenue they generated or what you generated in revenue with them it's actually on page 11 what was their revenue in 2016 and 2017 but most importantly what do you project that revenue to be in 2018 it's not as if at the end of the year we all go back to zero we've got a lot of carryover revenue that's going to be happening into the following year. So what you do is let's say your total revenue generation goal for 2018 is $500,000 and after you go through this worksheet you realize that it's highly likely you've already got $300,000 coming in because of your existing clients and what you can see in your crystal ball when you look at the engagement moving into 2018. But what that does is it gives you a real business development goal and that business development goal of course is two hundred thousand dollars I if I want to meet my revenue goal of five hundred thousand I need to generate two hundred thousand dollars in new business I can do that through my existing clients and contacts and referral sources or I can go out and find new business but if you know that you want to generate two hundred thousand dollars you can say well for example if you're a litigation attorney I want to attract two major cases that are each going to generate a hundred thousand dollars in fees or maybe your goals are that you would like to have multiple clients who are spending less with you but who get you up to that two hundred thousand dollars my point here is that you can't just identify a number and too many firms will say well you know this was your revenue last year let's just say that's going to be your revenue goal for this year and then that's it you know they don't think any more about it but I think you're going to feel more motivated to take action around your marketing plan if you set a real business development goal for yourself so we've talked a lot about what are the components of a strategic marketing plan for you and for your practice what are the components how do we identify objectives 
but now it's time to make an action plan. But before we go down that path too far, because there are two components of making an action plan, there's action that you're going to take with your contacts, and there's action that you're going to take in the form of projects, let's call them. But one thing I want you to know right now is that there is a distinct difference between sales and marketing, particularly lawyers don't want to think that they are going to graduate from law school. In fact, I mentioned I do a lot of presenting to law schools. One of the questions I'll ask at the beginning is, I'd like a show of hands. How many of you upon graduating from law school want to become a salesperson? And I raise my hand like, okay, where are all the hands? And they're looking at me terrified because nobody who's going to law school thinks that they're gonna have to become a salesperson, for heaven's sakes, right? But I am here to tell you that sales is the relationship side. It's the contact side of how you close deals, how you get new clients, how you persuade people to sign your retainer agreement. Marketing, on the other hand, is all about what you're doing out in the marketplace to keep your name recognition high. It's your website. It's your social media, it's your biography, it's your LinkedIn profile, it's where you're putting those important marketing messages. So marketing is all about making the right statements and positioning the right messages. Sales, on the other hand, is all about asking really great questions. Nobody wants to be sold to. So if you sit down with a prospective client and you start talking about how great you are and your credentials and where you graduated, and it, that's just not going to win friends and influence people. What you really need to do in sales is to think about really bright probing questions that you can ask that person that you're talking to. So what's nice is that sales is all about the other person. It's about your ability to extract from them the issues that might be relevant and probably the reason that they're sitting in front of you looking for your expertise. So the summary is that if you try to do marketing with just the messages, like buying billboards and telephone advertising and or telephone book advertising, it's just way too expensive hoping that marketing is going to be what generates all your clients. Not only is it expensive, it's really unrealistic. Sales, however, without marketing is too hard because if people don't know who you are, you're, you're climbing an uphill battle here because it's a combination. You have to have the right messages out there, but then you also have to be able to engage with people and ask the right questions. So if you try to do sales with no marketing, it's just way too hard, again, because people don't know who you are. So as I mentioned, there are two specific ways in which you're going to complete your action plan. The first one is about your contacts. You are going to go through and identify your top 10 lists. Then you're going to use the sales pipeline or a tool that you have that works for you to identify what am I going to do with this person next? Do I want to invite them to coffee or lunch? Maybe we can do a webinar together. What, what are your goals with the context that you have to further those relationships? Because I've heard so many people say, well, I really don't need to do much marketing because really I get referrals. Well, you get referrals because you've built your reputation and you've done a really great job in marketing and messaging and positioning yourself. But the bottom line is that it's the people who are going to refer you. And so therefore, it's very important to your overall marketing plan that you have a contact follow-up plan. Now, the other element, of course, are the activities. These are the things that you want to do. And you start with that elusive objective, your intention, what it is you want to do. And then the tactics are all about how you do that. So let's say you have an objective under client satisfaction. I want to achieve a 99% client satisfaction rating. It's specific, it's measurable, it's attainable. Well, how are you going to do that? One way is to conduct a client survey. 
maybe every three years. Another way is to have an end of engagement survey so that after you've tied a nice bow around your work with a particular client, you send them a survey that says, how responsive were we? How aggressive were we? Too aggressive, not aggressive enough? But the big question is, knowing what you know about your experience with us, would you refer us to other people? So this is a way that you can determine with assurance, quantifiably, that you have a 99.9 .9 satisfaction rating by whatever date you've decided that you want to have that data. So it's really important, again, that you start with the objective, what it is you want to accomplish, and then you work with a professional. You do some reading on what can I do to achieve the objectives that I have stated for myself. Having a marketing plan is also really helpful when you get these random calls and emails from people who want you to spend money with them and they say, wow, you just spend your money with us and you'll have a steady flow of all these great referrals. Well, that's not always the case. And when you have a marketing plan, you can say, this is not in my strategy, thanks anyway, bye-bye. Because you don't want to waste your time pursuing things that are not going to be in your best interest. So thinking about what is going to be in your best interest once a year is really time very well spent. Now this is just a slide that I wanted to throw in here because it really helped me. Many years ago I took a, a, a time management course. One of the things I found with professionals is that first of all they're highly educated and they tend to have perfectionistic tendencies. Okay, I'm admitting to you, I have them too. But here's what ends up happening sometimes. As a perfectionist, you never have enough time to do it the way that you want, to make sure that it's going to be perfect. So what do you do? You keep pushing it off and pushing it off. So this particular graphic gives you some tips on what to do. This is really basic, but for those of you who haven't adopted something like this, I encourage you to think about it. So the first thing is you do it. If there's something on your desk, let's say you've amassed a big stack of everything that's been on your desk for, for days or weeks, put it into a pile, pick up that thing, and you either do it now because it's going to be, it's going to take no time at all to do, or you recycle it because it's really not even relevant anymore. You thought it might be, but it's not. Or you delegate it. Delegation is one of the best things that you can do to maintain your productivity. When things get slow, don't hoard work. Rather, delegate the work so that it will free your time up to go out and find more clients. Delegation is an art, and I encourage each of you to think about, am I doing something that is truly the best and highest use of my time, or is it something I could delegate? So maybe that piece of paper, you can delegate it to someone else that you work with or to a colleague. Or, if you really do pick up that, the, the RFP questions, there are 20 of them, and you've been putting it off and the deadline is coming up, you know what, you need to decide when you're going to do that. You need to schedule time on your calendar. If you think it's going to take you five hours, then put an hour on your calendar for five days, or two and a half hours on Thursday, and again on Friday. But you have to, for certain things, you have to just simply decide when you're going to do it. Now, for those of you who haven't read this particular book, The E-Myth, I encourage you to do so. The E-Myth is all about how to take your practice and turn it into more of an enterprise. The E-Myth, E stands for entrepreneurial. And the point is that a lot of people who think they're entrepreneurial really aren't. Because a lot of people, for example, will leave, let's say you're with a, a large firm, whether it's a law firm or a brokerage firm, and you'll think, I'm going to go out on my own, and I'm going to become an independent attorney or financial advisor. Well, sometimes if you really don't have the, the, the entrepreneurial gene, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to attract clients and you're going to end up working in your business. You're going to be so busy. You're going to be maybe busier than you were when you worked for someone else. And you're going to realize that you need to take time. You need to step above your practice. You need to work on your practice versus just working in it.
So for those of you who feel that you're entrepreneurial, and we have a whole webinar on this topic, if you go to our website at psm-marketing.com and click on our webinar archive, I did a webinar just on you are the CEO of your practice, now act like an entrepreneur. But one of the big tenets, again, is working on versus in your practice. This is not my idea. There have been many wonderful business minds who have written books, whether it's the e-myth or good to great. There's a common thread, and it's that if you only work in your practice and don't step above it to do things like, for example, put your 2018 marketing plan in place, you're just going to end up owning a crazy job instead of being the CEO of a very successful business. So I encourage you to really do one thing every single day to work in your practice, excuse me, to work on your practice. Do one thing every day to grow your practice. Don't just get immersed in the work that you have in front of you. And that's why I put together the handout that's called 40 Ideas You Can Do in Five Minutes or Less because you don't want to wait until you have time to market because many times it'll be too late. Let's say you're an attorney and you've been involved in this long litigation case and you've fallen out of touch with people um, over the last year or six months or nine months or however long it's been and then you realize, oh my goodness, my case is going to be over next month. But you haven't done all the things that were necessary to really keep yourself in front of people who could refer business to you. You've let your contacts sort of get a little bit stale. And so this is a really great book that I've read. It's called Eat That Frog. And it's how to stop procrastinating and get things done. And as I said, most people who are professionals, you have advanced degrees. You have very, very high expectations of yourself. So it's important to acknowledge that, yep, I do procrastinate sometimes, and I do it because I'm trying to wait until I have this big magical block of time that I can do everything perfectly. And I'll tell you, that, that time generally never comes. So think about your time management and your organization, and do it now, do it today, don't put it off. So. In summary, we talked about how important it is to start your marketing plan with the people, the people who are working with you now, your colleagues, your professional connections out in the industry, the referral sources. Start with your contacts and build your marketing plan around those contacts. And once you've identified them, develop the specific messages that bring out the best and highest use of your talent and your expertise. And you have to do that by audience because the way that you would market to a trade association group is very, very different than what you would say to someone that you want to refer business to you. So make sure that you're thinking about your message and messages and audiences in a, very, in a way that makes them unique. We talked a lot about how important it is to create marketing objectives because without them you don't really have a plan. That once you have those marketing objectives, how important it is to have action plans and to have those plans in two areas. Your action plan for your contacts as well as the action plan for the, the, the strategies, the ideas, the tactics that you want to pursue. And it's through all of these activities together that you will achieve your marketing goals. I have a good friend who's an outsourced sales manager. And what he always tells people on his sales team, and I want you to really think about this, is that if you do the right things over time, you will be successful. So what does that mean? It means that you don't go, you, you don't, you're not a, a shiny object person. Oh, let me try this. Oh, that didn't work. Let me try that. You stick with your plan because you have a plan. You implement those marketing objectives that you've set for yourself. Because again, if you pursue the right things over time and don't give up, you will be successful. So now I'm getting the sense that for, for those of you who have made it this far through the webinar, you're, you're looking like this right now. You're looking at this like, wow, this is a lot of information to take in, and I know it is. But what's nice is that you have this webinar that you can watch again. We've got a lot of webinars on our website. And I also 
want to thank you very, very much for attending today. I hope that you'll reach out to me if you watch this webinar and you have questions. I don't bill anyone ever for asking questions. In fact, I love to brainstorm with people and I'd love to hear from you. So if there's anything in this entire webinar that you have questions about, I hope you won't hesitate to send me an email or just give me a call directly. I also hope that you'll take some time to explore our website at psm-marketing.com where, as I mentioned before, we do have an archive of all of the webinars we have done. And when I say we, I mean my business partner, Christy Gusick, and I have done over the past four years. There's a lot there. There's probably something there for something that might be one of your biggest marketing challenges. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your time and attention. And thank you again for attending this webinar.